Um, hope you had uh, a great lunch. You're filled up. Notebooks filled. Stomach filled. Uh, for those of you who drink a lot of coffee, there will be more opportunities to have that. Um, obviously, it's about redesigning organizations and uh, attracting and sustainable, uh, uh, attract and sustain happy performing people. Uh, and whether we can do that uh, without formal managers or not, that's the question for the panel. Uh, so we'll try to uh, deep dive into uh, sort of the what question, the why, the how, the who uh, questions of, of uh, being able to build self-managed organizations. Um, and, and sort of why is this a better model than the other ones and how do you do it and what's the pitfalls. And uh, we'll bring in um, some of the most curious people uh, around this topic uh, and they'll touch upon this uh, based on a few different perspectives. So here's the happy crowd uh, we'll be inviting up um, for, the, uh, for the panel. And the ambition really for the panel is to try to extract three, four, five things that uh, we're able to pinpoint as sort of the key most important things uh, to understand and, and to, to work with in order to have a self-managed organization work. Um, as some touched upon earlier, there are a lot of risks and there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't go about um, organizing your uh, company or organization this way. We'll touch upon a few of those as well. But So that's the, um, I'm just laying it out there that the ambition is to find three, four, five things uh, that we can all bring home. So we'll see if we manage. Uh, so, uh, super interesting crowd. Uh, we'll invite three friends up to begin with, uh, and then the rest, and then we'll spend time until somewhat, some time to 10 to 2, so some 40, 50 minutes uh, on this topic. Uh, I'd love to have uh, James Priest up on stage, and Mary Williams, and also uh, Joss, whom you met earlier today. So, big hand, please. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, it's the, the idea is for you to stand over here, sort of by the table, so don't be shy. Um, which I can, can genuinely say would be the case, because you're not Swedish. None of you, actually, I realize now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very sorry for being born in the wrong country. Yeah, sure. But it's okay. We're very happy to have you here anyway. Um, and and uh, uh, you both come from the UK, uh, Mary and, and James. And I thought I'd start off with, with you, James, because... Um, you've been uh, working around this topic for many years as both a project manager originally and then a consultant and you're a lecturer, you're an author, um, and you've tried these things out very much so in a sort of community organization environment, a lot of focus on collaboration. And um, you've also invented or founded uh, a framework, an organization called Sociocracy. 3.0, yes, I don't forget. But, but, and that's an area where you do a lot of evangelism in a sense and, and inspire and help people to, to work around that. But to, to just begin with, because some here know very well about that and some doesn't, what, what, what is sociocracy 3.0? Okay, well, um, sociocracy is basically governance or decision making by the peers, the friends, the companions, which in plain English means just giving decision making power to the people who are doing the work and um, removing interference from people who are just overseeing that or coming from a place of abstraction. And 3.0 is basically the discovery of uh, myself and my friend and colleague Bernard Bockelbrink out of Berlin. And we, we just noticed some tensions with the classic sociocratic framework and also with holacracy uh, and also some tensions around agile, particularly when it came to scaling agile and lean principles into organization. And what you, what's, the, what's the main difference between holacracy and sociocracy? Well, holacracy is a whole system. So Brian Robertson developed patterns for addressing operations as well as governance. He also sought to patent the original kind of framework from classic sociocracy, and that was turned down due to the fact you can't patent a process. Um, so there's a lot of influence from sociocracy, particularly the circle structure and the double links. And holacracy compromised somewhat on the consent principle. Um, and so, and holacracy relies on a full implementation. Uh, yeah. So um, S3 was basically through navigating the tensions that we saw in implementing these different frameworks into organizations, we stood back one day and saw that the process we were actually going through to find new strategies to address the unmet needs 
was the thing that we now call sociocracy 3.0 or S3. Okay, so a key component is various kinds of tensions and that, that you sort of learn to navigate and use in the right way. It's just recognizing that all of life unfolds according to need. So life continues until there's some kind of obstruction or problem or right. opportunity and then it changes. So it's making that conscious and explicit and the fact that we are by design very effective at doing that, it's just we do it in more or less conscious ways. And this is just a, a, a side reflection. When, when we spoke the other week and, and, and we talk about these things, you sort of realize that this is, this is a subject that is sort of far beyond how do we organize our people. It's, it's very much about looking into yourself and see what, what's purpose, roles, individuals. We talked about societal uh, uh, changes going on. So uh, we're not going to deep dive into that right now, but, but uh, you also do a, a speed talk um, yep. later on. So for those of you who want to uh, dig deeper, um, you also say that you can't um, you can't just implement uh, these practices. You can't just say uh, and invite your employees to just go about doing this in, the, in, in th this new way. Well, to quote my friend Daniel Mezik, you can't mandate agile principles and practices into organization. You have to invite people to participate because otherwise it's just a hypocrisy of the essence of what you're seeking to do. Right. Yeah, so invitation is paramount. And if people can't locate themselves in the story of change, then why would they engage their short, precious lifetime in doing so? Yeah. And, and, and th I think that's a good takeaway, and we'll come back to that, because that's where you have the tension between management and employees. Uh, Mary. <laughs> Hi, is it is on? Is this on? Yeah, there it is. Go. It is. Just speak I love that they look like Britney, and I get to pretend to be a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'd also just, I, I know this doesn't feel important in Sweden, but I'm from South Africa. I'm from a country that's still in the Rugby World Cup right now, not England. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of key messages in 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, I, I just learned the Britney whole thing just now. So from now on, I'll call myself Tommy Britney when I'm on stage. Anyway, uh, that's not why we're here. You run a micro consulting company out of uh, the UK? Yeah, London. in yep. London. Yep. Um, although, I, as you said earlier, I've just uh, three weeks ago taken on a, a, a normal employed full-time job again um, to go be CTO of MS.com. Which is Marks and Spencer's online uh, business. H how, uh, I mean, and you're you no know, newbie in a sense to, to this, this, um, this whole framework in this way of working and the agile methodologies, you've done that for many years. But you were also in, in P&G for God knows how many years. A very, very uh, long time, yes. Right. Um, which I think it, it's very interesting going into Marks and Spencer because I think all the architects are convinced I'm not just going to raise everything to the ground because they see my PNG experience and then MS are looking for what I, more what I did at the government digital service, which was to, um, to help government be a lot more agile. Um, so it's quite, quite interesting. Oh, that's a how challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but you might uh, have help from your background, which is artificial intelligence, which is probably as cool as it gets in a sense. but. Um, but, but yeah, we'll see how that connects to, to this management philosophy. One thing um, I wonder, it, 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 it sounds like quite a bold move by Marks & Spencer to, to hire you into their fairly traditional organization. Is that just me mixing um, things up? So, so the much bolder move they made was, it was a few years ago where they hired a guy called Kyle McGinn, who, who I have a huge amount of um, a time for and, and going to get to work with him is, is part of the reason. I've done it where they, where they realized that that kind of traditional program management approach to things maybe wasn't, wasn't great. And they hired him into uh, to run a labs team um, and, and have found that that kind of agile way of going from idea to something that you can test whether it's really working, whether users really want it, customers really want it as, as quickly as possible, have a small autonomous team that gets to build what they think is important to make the customer experience better. Um, and we've really just seen it scale out of that. Um, so, so there's actually already a, a really brilliant product um, product team over there, uh, and now we're just into the how do we level up our engineering capability to be able to to build, basically, build build the kind of capability that we can't buy. Um, right. Okay. Which is about how we survive the the coming change. You can't hold back the ocean, but you can learn to surf. I think is the. Right? All right, there we go. Another key message. Uh, the uh, I was I, I was I'm a bit intrigued by your by your background with with PNG because one of the things they they price themselves with uh, is obviously uh, management training. So so I, 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 it just 
maybe it's not a paradox in any way, but it's it's interesting that uh, you've been trained in an environment that is one of the world's best trainer in, in management and leadership skills. And, and now we're spending a whole conference on sort of uh, flushing out the management layers uh, with the uh, early water. Is, 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 or is that so? Should we do that? Or, I mean, you've spent your career in... So th I think P&G and, and I think GE is the only company that um, produces more C-level execs for other companies than Proctor. Um, and what they're brilliant at is teaching people, is helping create an environment where people learn fast and um, level up and become great enablers of others. So people look at the people who stay at Proctor for a really long time and are like, wow, you had the same job for 15 years. I was there for 10 years and I did seven completely different roles. Um, and so they, they've become a very, very good at having a system where they can move people around and that be incrementing their ability to be effective um, each each time. So you, you get to stay in an organization that you understand and you know how to get shit done, um, but you go experience a completely different part of the business. Um, and I think I think that's interesting. Um, I think we're I'm th three years gone from PNG now, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on the inside anymore. I still I still say we. Um, it's, sometimes it's in your blood. Um, I, I think what's what's becoming interesting for them as a company is um, that if you have people who join at graduate level and stay for 30 years, they have to try very hard to be connected outside to understand right. um, that outside influence. And uh, I think doubling down and believing that you'll 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 discover yourselves everything interesting that's happening outside is, is probably not a winning philosophy anymore. Um, but it's also not a philosophy they're trying to hold anymore. They're, they're, they're very much moving away from that. They're also moving into to this century in a sense, and, and, and this this movement <laughs> movement. But it, but it's interesting because PNG then obviously looks like uh, many other companies, and some of them we have represented here today. So it's good just to tap into some of that experience. But basically, you're saying that uh, management is not evil, and it's not only uh, we're not going to get rid of of all management in a, in a sense, because um, there's good things with it. So so I come from an AI background, and and. Um, I, I, the talk I'm doing today isn't about this, but but I, I did research that was the was the Venn diagram of overlapping between artificial intelligence and project management, which is like being the only person in the world who gives a fuck about that particular topic. Um, <laughs> it's not not a really popular research discipline. Um, but the so I used to be a project man manager, and what what we found in AI was all of these all of these things that we thought worked from people project management of like, the important thing is to follow the plan well. There's lots of project management pr practitioners who will tell you that compliance is the problem. The process is great. These squishy humans who don't do as they're told are the problem. And we tried that. We tried, like robots really don't mind being doing what they're told. They don't have any kind of uh, existential angst about not feeling in control of their lives or any of that. That They're obedient, they're tireless, and it doesn't work. <laughs> So even if you remove the squishy human problem, all of those traditional ways of planning and operating as um, those traditional techniques do not work. And what does work is exactly what Josh described this morning, which is you help um, agents as, or robots um, to know what they're trying to achieve, to know what they're capable of, and to make the right decision in the moment based on the environment and, uh, and, to, and to do the right thing. So, so what, what, I find, what I find funny is that we talk about this as being like a, a very different thing that we need to do, that it's the only way in a complex system it'll work. We have these complex systems in technology. The way they work is by being more autonomous, able to learn and able to act independently, but towards a common goal. Um, and so actually what, what robots would teach us is the same thing as we hear when we, when we hear inspirational stories like this. Okay, so either we listen to the robots or we listen to you, Joss. Um, or both, hopefully. Because um, how do you relate to this? Because you built a company with no managers, basically. And, and, and we have a discussion here. Is it, is it all management and, and managers, uh, per definition, that we want to get rid of for various reasons? Or are there good management and, and good managers? And um, <coughs> do you hear me? Yeah. I think there are evil things in management. So, um, what I what I learned is that um, throughout the years, um, first as a as a nurse and later as a manager director, is there is a lot of um, um, there are a lot of images about management uh, which doesn't fit reality. I think so. Managers themselves think they are important, and they are the cause of the things which are happening in organizations. So, and I I think that's not. 
that's not true. I, I said to my colleagues, I think if we stay home today and the coming weeks and the coming months, nobody will notice. And perhaps some things will even go better than when we are just disturbing the daily work. <laughs> but I, I think that's a good exercise to do. Just sit down for five minutes and just think about what would it actually mean if I just stayed home for three weeks? Uh, not checking don't, your don't email. Just think about it. Go home for three weeks. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> I, think, I think what's more important is, is if, if, you, if you're um, delivering services or, or making products, I should ask the question, uh, what kind of support do you need to make the best possible things? So, because I, I look at it from an economical perspective and I say, if you build this management structure and HR structure and so on, it costs a lot of money. So you have to um, have a legitimation to do this. So, and if you can integrate so these different aspects in the daily activities of people and not in persons, then I think it will be m m much more effective. So I, I agree completely with what you're saying that the world is, is complex, getting more complex, and you have, to, you have to be able to make the decisions at the moment you are dealing with them. So, and what, what my, in my opinion, the hierarchical structures avoid people to make the right decisions at the right moment. So, so it's, 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 it's you have to need, to, I think you, you need to find a balance. And um, I, I think that, that only talking about management, already what I said this morning, I should broaden the perspective and as you think there are different ways to organize and th the management and management language uh, creates some kind of a tunnel vision in my opinion so we should be more open to different ways of organizing uh, and it leads to more creativity because if you're all using this um, management language all the time then it's it's uh, it's disturbing uh, disturbing I, I think a lot of uh, professionals don't know this um, uh, l management language. I, I usually, I see when, when nurses who are working for us uh, have had a meeting, for example, with uh, some other people from other or organizations, usually they are then the managers. They're using other language. They don't understand each other. But the nurses usually think that they have more ideas, the, the managers have more ideas by the way they talk and the language they use. And I always say, no, it's less because they try to cover up what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, for, for me, that's this creating this world uh, mm. uh, has a lot of um, uh, damaging things in it. And that doesn't mean that managers are bad. Right. I think a lot of managers have the, the right intentions. So I'm not against managers, but I think we should be aware of the consequences in, in how organizational behavior develops how people develop in and can grow in organizations and how it's if it's supportive or is it uh, working out more negative yeah let's up, invite up uh, two, two more friends uh, and and we'll broaden the discussion as well um two uh, other pr practitioners in a sense maria furenmo who's uh, a, a consultant these days but spent uh, a lot of years uh, as an hr director formerly uh, just recently um, stepped out of NetEnt, and Karin Tenelius, who's a CEO and serial entrepreneur in a sense. So please welcome up on stage. <laughs> you're making a lot of room. It it's feels almost a bit distant, but <laughs> your call. Uh, hi. <laughs> there we go. You want to perch? In Sweden, we have so much space, you know, so we, we try to get closer sometimes. Uh, anyway, uh, Maria, uh, hi. You, hi. You, you've spent, you're the HR director in this uh, crowd. Exactly. Uh, you've done that for 17 years. I love HR. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you two will have a nice chat, yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but, so, but some but of your best friends are HR directors, <coughs> right? <laughs> But, but, but see, it's, uh, what, what's fascinating is that you have a, a very uh, sort of broad background. I mean, you've been in, in steel, in finance, in gaming. So, so it's, it's uh, some of the things that we talk about here, I know for a fact that you've been working on hands-on. Um, and uh, it's um, 
notably when, when we look at what, what you've done is it's a lot of fast moving IT related industries. Um, how do you, um, yeah, how do you relate to all this looking at it from the HR director's seat in a sense, from what Joss talked about this morning and, and how we build organizations in, 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 in this way? From, yeah, well, I heard Joss talking about uh, we don't have an HR organization or an HR function as the the, the sort of the benefits, the, <laughs> the benefits of this. Uh, I think that maybe uh, Josh has a, a more traditional and conservative view of, of, the, of the HR function. And I think uh, uh, the HR function is, is changing as well as other functions and, and the way we organize ourselves. And, uh, but I think uh, maybe we will see more, more MDs uh, as, uh, and they have the background in HR, for example, right. instead. Yeah. Instead of engineers. And I think it was Harvard Business Review that actually okay. claimed that last year, that mm. the potentially the best possible CEO, uh, in their view of any company, mm. would be the CHRO, so mm. the, the HR director, but of course for various for, reasons. For, for me, uh, I've always been working with the managers. That yeah. has sort of been my, I view um, my role as the, the one working with the managers in the organization. Uh, but, uh, and of course, if we don't have, na have any, any managers, what will happen then? <laughs> uh, but what will happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think, yeah, and I've been always been, been driving uh, sort of value, add, um, um, uh, have a culture and a value driven organization. And uh, it's exactly what is described here. So, uh, so I, I'm totally into this and I think we can do a lot more and we are in a very exciting movement at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to see more organizations as as uh, process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you, you've worked in, uh, I said steel, that may not be the most fast growing industry uh, on the no. planet, but you also uh, headed up uh, HR at NodeNet during the sort of booming years. Uh, you've taken, you've been part of taking NetEnt, which is formerly Net Entertainment, which is casino gaming, from, you know, small to super successful. So it's it's been pretty fast. How do you, um, What's the most difficult sitting in the HR director's seat, working with the managers, getting them to move in this direction? Because I imagine it's challenging. Yeah, but it's, it's not, not actually the managers, it's the management team and the board, I would say. It's the biggest challenge when we talk about this. Because the managers, and they really want to develop. We talked a lot about ex inclusive leadership and transformational leadership and to build self-driven employees. Uh, so it, it's exactly what we're talking about there. But, but, but the problem is the management team and the board who wants to have the budget and the figures and the key KPIs and stuff like that. Right. So, so that's at, at least my experience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it goes back to, and some of these companies you worked for all, all have also been listed companies yeah. on the stock exchange. Just good as a context mm. reference. Um, Karin, Tenelius, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you're sort of a serial CEO entrepreneur that have been practicing these things since the 80s. Yes, but don't call me CEO because I never, that's just a joke uh, <laughs> at the office. I don't think anybody it knows so that in I'm a few CEO. places, yeah. but serial entrepreneurs then. Yeah. Uh, because you've tried these practices. I mean, you've been in hotel business, you've been in the call center business. Uh, you're now in, in education, among other things, uh, trying to get managers and leaders to work in new ways? Yes, I read some books in the 80s when I was at school and then I tried out the theories there, uh, very inspired by Ricardo Semler, for instance, and uh, it took, I think, 12 years before I could try it out for real in a small company. And then I just kept going in very small companies, though. Yeah, and when we say small, what's the scale? Well, at the most I had 55 employees in like five or seven companies. So it's that size. And, and you, yeah, so you've been quite successful in some of these companies. Um, and, and, but you've also been, I know, when we had this pre-chat, you, you said that you've also been tremendously challenged and criticized and sort of uh, challenged in the way you do things. Yes, uh, because I was early. I, I mean, in the 90s, I stood and, and talked about this in crowds like this. And it wasn't very well received everywhere <laughs> because, yeah. So, uh, and the, it was a lot of uh, argument about it's against the law and, you know, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about. Is it against the law? No. no. Okay. <laughs> just, just checking. 
Um, Could be the but, case. But why do you why do you think this is such a controversial? Uh, I think people hear chaos. Um, okay, yeah. They hear chaos always, and uh, it has nothing to do with chaos. Uh, the structures are there, but the structures are invented by the people that will live with, with the structures. So right. th that's just the, the difference. It's a lot of order order in the companies. Yeah, but it's it's also. Um I mean, people in general don't like chaos. It's not only management that doesn't like chaos. It's all sort of all of us prefer, in a sense, some kind of order. And when we talked, you also said that one of the most fundamental things that we underestimate beyond imagination uh, when we to do these things is the fact that uh, people need to be on board in sort of doing this. So uh, yes. forget about managers. Yeah. There's so and so many people, but then we have an entire organization that yeah. needs to be on board in starting to work in these ways. Can you yes. reflect upon that? And uh, I also have taken over old companies with really a uh, lot of old culture um, where they weren't allowed to, to do really basic things without allowance. allowance. But uh, when, when, uh, when we initiate this change, all the co-workers welcome it. It's like, yes! We can have a say. That's not. That's really great. And then is this uh, honeymoon <laughs> for for a while, and then it's really rough because everybody understands that it includes dealing with all their colleagues. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you actually need to collaborate and deal with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And then the trouble starts or the challenges. And in the other end of that, there is a lot of um, confidence, openness, and safety. How fast have you transitioned? Because well, you've done this a number of times. Yeah, my first two cases went really quick. I, I get afterwards because... Uh, uh, so eight to nine months. And also that included to go from a big loss to profit, um, unexpectedly, actually. Uh, <laughs> the profit or the loss? Always good yeah. with positive surprises. The, the, the profit became much, much bigger than we okay. ever could dream of. Uh, okay. in so two it's, cases. A, it's a good financial model. Yeah. But the lost well. cases, it took much longer than I thought. Okay. So. Yeah. But, but here's, here's the, uh, also what you said, that, uh, and, and this might go for, for Sweden, it might go for the entire world, I don't know, but you said that the problem we have is that employees are so goddamn employed. And it's not evil, <laughs> but it's a mindset that is really hard to yeah. to come to terms with. But one of the one of the people I learned the most from when I was doing GDS um, highlighted this brilliant quote, which is, "Under stress, people do what they've always done, whether it worked or not." And, right. and I think that often what we see in these kind of transformations, um, when we're going from from one state to another, is um, it's fine. Pe even if people are bought into it, even if they really want the, the change that, that's happening, under stress, under pressure, they'll revert to what they've always done. And, and ha making space for that to be a bump along the road rather than a catastrophe is, is part of what I think you have to, have to do. And let, letting people understand that this is on the horizon and that this is part of the deal in navigating transformation. I was reading the Dalai Lama a couple of days ago talking about the need for self-discipline in embracing this kind of transformational right. process to to hold ourselves and be aware of that invitation to fall back into previous strategies under stress or when more vulnerable but it's good then because world and work right now is not that stressful right so it's we, we exactly. do have time and energy to explore yeah. um wh why don't we broaden up the discussion because this is a topic that that is one of the very fundamentals uh i think we agree on uh, h how much of of the challenges can be divided. Or actually, we'll do a, a quick poll, not in the audience, but we can do that too, actually. Um, a poll on stage where the biggest challenges lies in, in doing these, these transitions that we're talking about. Is it within managers and management, or is it with the employees? Having the interest, the willingness, energy to, to move in, in, to work in this new uh, model. Uh, raise of hands. Uh, management is the primary problem. Not managers, management. Stopping, management managers. stopping managers managing. Yeah, exactly. Stopping, okay, yeah, so, so that's the well biggest said. problem. Okay. That's the biggest problem. Uh, we'll, we'll do a poll here as well. Uh, management and managers, 
being the biggest problem or uh, the individuals? It was like a fallout rate of uh, 80%, so, so we'll do it again. Management is the problem. Employees as individuals are the problem. Okay, interesting. Can I say, I don't think there's a problem. Go ahead. I think there's a tension. Yes. And there's a disproportionate distribution of function. Uh, and, we, and it's important to recognize that a role is just a strategy to deliver value somehow yeah, to needs. And it's one that we're culturally familiar with. And some functions are more clear than others. So like a leadership function, for example, we can understand leadership. I'm in meeting you, Joss, and having the conversation. It's like you, the company is successful because of your strong facilitative leadership, I would say. And there's a, really a pattern where a number of organizations might make some kind of transformation towards more distributed leadership. But when the kind of benevolent leader or the facilitative leader pulls out or the coach pulls out and so on, then it can very fast return back to that old pattern again. And I don't think it's about who's the problem. It's just there's an opportunity and attention and everybody's accountable. I think we're all accountable. Is that a, a key component, making sure that you, there's a facilitator, a coach, or a, I think you refer to them as translators in a sense almost. Um, they have to be there. So you can't just rip all of them out or but it's in a way, I'm just sort of no, but I, I, no I, I, I was thinking about what you were saying. But if you, if you look at the average um, management education, it's focusing on on the hard things. So it's it's not it's not a, uh, so much about uh, psychosociology or um, how to how to communicate. It's the the average MBA is too much focusing on the hard parts of the organization. So so the attitude of a lot of people who become manager is uh, unbalanced in my opinion so we should we should train them more with more uh, spiritual things and <laughs> more, more other things so one, one of the articles um Shada Nandram, the book i mentioned wrote she said um one of the reasons that things are going so well within the organization is that there is a good balance between material things and spiritual things and in i think Society, if you look at the last 30, 40 years, we moved very fast to the material things and uh, missed part of this, the things which creates a soul in the organization. Recognizing our interdependency. Also, yeah. Are, are these managers that we, we talked about, um, are they aware that, or to what extent are they aware that we can actually work in new ways and, and actually, if we just take the time, or are they too stressed and focused on? When I get into an organization where there are managers, I take them away and give, so they be part of the team. Okay, yeah, that's a quick yeah. solution. And, and uh, in the beginning, the team needs a lot of facilitating, yeah. and then you're totally unnecessary. So, so just a step back. So when you go in and you buy a company or you move in as a CEO, uh, you just take the management out? Yeah, I don't fire it. I mean, they are still there, but they're not okay. in the manager role anymore. Okay. Mm. Uh, and what do you do in order for that to work fairly smoothly? Because uh, it sounds fairly well, I was, I w I've been lucky because those managers really long for this way of working. Okay. Um, so they were not top managers, they were like middle managers, women, and they really thought it was a good idea to work this way. And no, no, nobody when they're, you know, when you're like six years old and they go, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's all like fireman. Nobody says manager, right? <laughs> it's not, we don't grow up with this as like a really aspirational career choice. I'm just like, you know, one day I'm going to put a suit and tie on. I'm going to be awesome. It just doesn't happen. Nobody it wants to happen. be a boss. But, uh, but uh, I think one, one sort of tension or problem you have is when you have a very successful company. Yeah. And you have a lot of money, a lot of profit, and, and, and then if you want to drive change, it's quite difficult because then why, why should we change this? This is a success story. So, uh, but I think in order to, to stay uh, at least attractive as an employer, you need to change in this direction. Otherwise, we won't be there in five, ten years' time. I yeah. think especially in five or ten years' yeah. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and this is really at the, the core also of, 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 of your responsibility mm -hmm. um, as an HR director is making sure that we have enough talent uh, of the, the right caliber and that they're engaged and, and uh, whether it's your responsibility or channeling it through the leaders, uh, but, but still it's on your plate in a sense. 
is 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 that one of the core drivers you see in yeah. the, in the way you work that it it's about talent attraction yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, and a sort of um, motivated people and happy people at work i think that's quite important and that's my why or my purpose yeah. so yeah. that's important for me when i work so, but I think we were talking about leadership training or manage, training managers a little bit earlier. And, and, and I think uh, I've been part of so many, you know, um, designing manager tra training for managers to become leaders, you know, the leadership skills, train feedback, train how to, you know, have a dialogue with people, conflicts. And, but I hope we will see uh, or the other way around that we find leaders and then we train them in, you know, P&L and budget or whatever we want to have so that we have the leaders and then sort of train them in this, this other hard stuff. Yeah. Right. And we will yeah. never That's easier. reverse. That's yeah. much easier. Training. Yeah. We will never f know where to find them. We will be surprised where we find them, mm. yeah, mm. I think. But is, isn't that, um, because I, I, we don't do leadership trainings and so on. I, my, my opinion, you become a leader because you're taking responsibility for what you see. And in daily practice, by becoming a more and more senior professional or, or uh, nurse or, or policeman. Uh, yeah, yeah, but of course, the, what I talked about was a little bit more like if you have managers, if yeah. you're not the organization like yours, because you don't have managers in that way. But a lot of uh, organizations still, still have, most of them. So that's, that's sort of, I think, the first step maybe towards something else. But when we talk about what you're talking about, I think it's more like self-leadership, to lead yourself, to be aware about, your, aware about yourself and your motivation or, or whatever. That that's, is so important and it starts very early. I, I, I quite enjoy reading kind of interviews and conversations with, with people who are very respected at bigger organizations. Uh, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, but. But, 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 but it's interesting because I, th I think we have this kind of uh, pointy head boss view of what a manager is. And when you speak to like the best leaders and managers I knew at P&G, they, they were not telling anybody what to do ever. And they had worked out early in their careers that that was not the successful strategy. And they had found yes. different ways to, to approach it. And they were much more about enabling the right team to do the right things. And they're in a bigger organization. So sometimes what they're also doing is providing air cover or be helping somebody who knows what localized needs to happen, but needs to understand something else. So being a translator is, is sometimes a valuable thing. But I think, I think we have this kind of view that if, if we critically looked at who succeeds in those kind of management roles, many of them are not acting the way that we're worried about. They're acting the way that we would like them to, but they are burdened with this title and this perception and sometimes a set of words and vocabulary that is really not helpful, which I completely agree with. Um, first of all, we're going to rip your mic off because it broke. So you're going to oh. use that one. Um, so you, no more Britney Spears, I'm afraid. Um, it's not working, I'm afraid. Uh, so, so, so who will then be the the leaders or the managers in, in, in this paradigm? If, and again, there will be a transition. We have this futuristic image of no having no managers at all. But until we get there in about 100 years, how do we make sure that managers and leaders transition? I mean, who will be, who will be the translators rather than the managers? HR director. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be a people person, first of all. Yeah. It's not about the education. It's more about uh, the view you have on people and uh, their capabilities. I would say. So how do we make, because uh, again, you've been very instrumental in building a few of these things and institutionalizing them in NetEnt, for example, and, and, and NodeNet. How do you get that across? So now we will start recruiting nurses only, or now we will make sure that the finance department ho holds a lot of HR people instead. I mean, how, how do we try to make that, that actually happen? And you've pushed some boundaries in your former job. I mean, how do you, because it also sounds like fairly bold moves. Yeah, but I think uh, use good examples um, and inspire and uh, encourage courage, right. I would say. Yeah. Because I think it's a lot about courage. I mean, that, 
I, I'd really echo that. One of the one of the saddest things is where you go into an organisation and you find these people who are quietly putting up with a load of shit and trying to do better and um, doing all the right things in all the right ways and just being beaten down by how all of the the ways of measuring performance are set up. And so I think there's a there's a there's a overall piece of going let, let's measure success the right way and 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 let's let's reward the right things so somebody's professional success shouldn't be at odds with uh, doing the right thing but uh, but, uh, but very often that is how we are set up right I wonder if it's the right question really like who's going to do this because I think it comes back to all of us and everybody's at a different stage in their own personal development and that relative to the context of the culture in which they're in and what I see is an emergence of people who either through just immense suffering have had enough of their current paradigm and are asking if not this then what you know and others who are more um, sort of preemptive and seeing the possibility of alternatives on the horizon and there's this emergence happening grassroots throughout organizations, throughout communities, <coughs> particularly in the younger generations now. And, and I wonder if, it's, if we can be a bit arrogant in thinking, oh, who, which expert now is going to facilitate this process? It seems that facilitation as a practice is what's required, you know, to draw out the inherent skills, creativity, and potential. And I worked 10 years with at-risk young people, and we had, we had a... Um, a potential orientated approach to engagement with them, which is like nobody tells the acorn how to grow into an oak tree. You know, it's just ridiculous because this, this seed has all that it needs. It just needs the right environment to flourish. And so people are very much looking at their environment now. They're dissatisfied with the story they were told would be satisfactory for them. And they're looking much more to their own needs and what would bring them more happiness and fulfillment. And that seems to be a meme that's spreading. So I think this telling our stories, inviting others, if others can relate to it, then them sharing their stories and finding frameworks, patterns, processes, examples, people who are resonant with those. You know, there's something for everybody out there. I wonder if we have to try so hard, really, or if it's more about acknowledging actually what's emerging and sharing this story and sharing our excitement with it and recognizing that there is hope. Yeah. It's, and it's down to all of us, not down to some expert. <clears throat> I think uh, the, the water to the oak in those is, is uh, what I say, is a culture of safety, confidence, respect. And uh, so what I try to do when I buy a company, it's a lot of fear. And uh, you, you just put confidence and safety and trust. And so that's the water that is needed. Uh, and it's yeah. So, so, so in a sense, will, will will the will the individual employee become the manager? In a sense, so it's 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 a leadership training in the future will not really exist. Uh, you have a leadership training company. I'm sorry to say, but but it's, no, no, no. <laughs> that's fine. It, it, it will be something completely different. Yeah, it is about skills uh, and. Uh, why do I don't spend so much time in my leadership company because it serves hierarchical companies and right. that won't be the case forever, I hope. <laughs> so I, I um, totally agree that uh, leadership will uh, unleash in other ways in the future. Right. Um, okay, so um, where do you find the ones that are good at doing this? I mean, we have a, a full crowd here with, that comes from all different kinds of, of places. They need to start digging into the good examples, the ones that are, are good at, at, at doing a few of these things that, that we're mentioning. Uh, should we all look at Sappos and then be fine with it? Or, or should we... Uh, let's have a discussion about Sappos because <laughs> that you were boiling. <laughs> No, no, but I mean, that, that's, that's one example. We had a Morningstar. There's a few examples that are used uh, again and again. Any other examples or comments for that matter on the examples? Um, I, I mean, I think, I think we labor under this illusion that people want things to be the way they are. And I choose to believe that everybody comes to work wanting to be brilliant. And I don't, I don't think there's anybody who goes, you know what? Today I'm getting out of bed and I'm shooting for just south of mediocre. <laughs> 
we're not like that as people. Like there are people who they can't deliver their best right now because something's going on or this, the the situation they're in isn't great. But nobody comes to work going, I want to be I want to be pretty shit at what I do. We um, test that. <laughs> <Not> really. <laughs> do, do I, does anybody you... go to work going, I want to be just south of mediocre today? Okay, thanks. Not that many. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. So I feel like we're often talking about it like we have to go and um, incite something in, in people um, that, that, that isn't easily there or like we have to become be transform ch change agents. Oh my God, unless you're actually a secret service agent, you don't get to call yourself an agent. <laughs> um, but like a lot of this is just get the fuck out of people's way and help, help the whole situation be better for people to do the right thing in the right way and be rewarded for that rather than punished for it. Um, and I think it's fantastic. I mean, I'm so, I, I so wish I got to start from scratch ever because that would be, that would be, <laughs> it, 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 in, some, in some ways, being able to just do it right from the beginning is such an amazing opportunity. Um, but, I, but I don't think that, like, companies aren't people, systems are just systems, we can change them, we just, and, and I don't think we need to believe that we have to make that happen to people. People want that, we just need to stop stopping it. I was Sorry, just, yeah, I'll, I was I'll get off my uh, soapbox now. <laughs> I'm just, you asked for examples, and I think, yeah. of course, that's good to, to look at different examples, but, but I also think we can just go home and look in our own organizations and see what we can do and start there. Uh, normally, we want to have sort of a recipe and yeah and bring that home. And I think we all can go home and, and make a change uh, so to start what should, what, what, should, what, what can HR start doing? In it? And what are, the, what are the, some of the things that you've tried out? Yeah, um, I, I will work more with self-leadership when it comes to employees. Yeah. Uh, I have been focus, focusing a lot on manager training or leadership training. Uh, but I think, I think uh, one of the recipes for this is to have the, sort of the driving force from, from, from the people, from the crowd. And uh, if, you, if you train people or give them the, the sort of the, the safe environment and, and to be able to lead themselves, then I think this will sort of come naturally in a way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the key thing is to give away the authority mm. and the control. There to get and nobody wants that. Authority. Right, exactly. It sounds like an easy task, but mm -hmm. maybe we should just add in effective solution oriented decision making as well to help people skill up on how to make decisions together, how to tap the collective intelligence that lies within teams. <clears throat> because a lot of people are struggling to manage with the tools and processes they inherited from before, and they're not necessarily so effective. Right. So I think the governance side is often underappreciated in terms of how to navigate, guide the flow of value, you know, in order, basically by optimizing the flow of information through systems so that people who need to know things and people who do know things can transmit rapidly that information and it doesn't go between somebody who holds it all in an, some kind of autocratic position. Not enough. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but it's not enough. Uh, more things need to be done. Uh, I think young people will um, create uh, one dis disruptive innovation after another. So we'll see the bigger companies who are not changing yet, they will be forced to change or they won't live anymore after 10 years. So young people don't accept the way we build the organization. It's a 50 plus problem. So it's an intergenerational problem. We are built on, uh, uh, most organizations are built on, on power, status uh, and, and money. And uh, if, we want, if we want to accelerate, then we have to create environments, in my opinion, which uh, uh, give the opportunity to the, to the people to do their work as the way we are talking today. Uh, and if we don't do it, we will be forced to do it. Because I, I think what you see all over the world, disruptive innovations are, more, are there more and more. A lot of money to keep these organizations running and what comes out of it is less and less. So it's also my perspective and I'm happy that I started two years for economics. It's also an economical <laughs> issue, my opinion.
And also, I was thinking about the stress-related problems we have in the, uh, at least in Sweden, <laughs> uh, and it's it's uh, sort of increasing. And I think uh, it's also this is also uh, that can be a sort of a, a driving force for change. Right. Uh, so I think we, we should look at the stress-related problems uh, as a as a sort of a. Um, uh, source for for change uh, and to have more self self managed organizations and I think that's why people are so stressed stressed at work. This this is a clash between how we are how we are as human beings and how we are organized. I completely agree with that. In S3, we we say that tension is a symptom of wisdom or new information seeking emergence. And if you look at the current level of stress amongst the human species today, that's a lot of wisdom seeking emergence, I would say. <laughs> um. I think that has to be the final word, actually. Uh, but if you would have one thing to say, and you have 10 seconds each in a sense, one, uh, the most important key message on sort of get, on how to get this to work, what would that be? Karin, you're sort of all fired up, so yes. you can start. I want to ask you, Josh, do you think we need to have a crash or can we do it painlessly change in no. society? I think both. The crash is already happening. So it's, it's there and I don't, uh, a lot of people don't notice. But uh, if it's either on ecological or on, on energy or all kinds of themes. So we are in transition and we are in change of eras. And the coming, the coming 10, 20 years, I think we will experience the consequences of that. So if we, are, we can, of course, go on with a very gentle way of changing organizations. But if you are not aware of, the, of what we are doing now, so wisdom and awareness, I think, are very important things at this moment. Uh, then um, you, as an organization, as that is, as that is your goal, an organization, you won't survive. That's, that's my... You agree? Yeah. <laughs> okay. One thing. Yeah, just look in inside your own organization and start in a small scale. Inside, start in small mm -hmm. scale. Key takeaway. Be radical. Be radical. <laughs> we need a transition. We need a transition. Yes. James? Evolution, not revolution. And we're the ones we've been waiting for. Okay. Very good. Stop trying to hold back the ocean. Let's all learn to surf. <laughs> Which is very much get out of people's way. All right. Uh, big hand for the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>